Our lecturer this evening is MCHA Director of Collections and my good friend, Bernadette Rogoff. For our regular historically speaking viewers, you know that you're in for a treat because Bernadette is an excellent researcher and she always uncovers something new. So you're gonna learn uh, things here tonight that you haven't heard before. And without further ado, please welcome Bernadette Rogoff. All right, let me share my screen here. Screen, share, and all right. So does that look good, Dana? I'm on. That looks great. All righty. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this presentation. My heartfelt thanks to Dana. Um, she's our librarian archivist. She is fabulous. I am so honored to work with her. And thank you, Dana, for making this possible with your amazing tech skills. So as many of you know, uh, the association has been working on the reinterpretation of its houses, incorporating the stories of many whose stories were not told. Our Living and Breathing Project uh, is going to be reinterpreting all our historic houses. And the first part of this project is at Marl Pitt Hall, Beneath the Floorboards, Whispers of the Enslaved. And um, it's on permanent view. If you have not yet seen it, please do so. I think you'll really enjoy it. It's a really intimate, powerful look at the lives of seven men, women, and children who lived as enslaved in Marl Pitt Hall. Uh, so now we're going to turn our attention to the Allen House is the next phase of living and breathing. Uh, and that goes along with a major restoration project for this house. And that's my personal favorite of all our houses. And we plan to complete that in 2026. So anytime you drive by there, keep your eyes open because you'll see a lot going on. Now, while tavern keeper Josiah Halstead, who ran the Allen House as a tavern, left very little behind in the way of personal documents, we do know that he had at least two indentured servants working for him at different times. So that's where I began my research. And because the majority of indentured servants in the American colonies were Irish, I focused my exploration on them. My father, John Joseph Sigler, passed away last month. So I'm dedicating this presentation to him. Uh, his storytelling abilities about his childhood and his memories and also his encouragement is one of the main reasons that I do what I do. His mother, Bernadine Garrity Sigler, was the daughter and granddaughter of Irish immigrants around the time of the potato famine. Ireland, it looks like the beginning of the world. The sea looks older than in other places somehow. The hills and rocks strange and formed differently from other rocks and hills. Ireland is fraught with history and drama. Fraught is a word you don't hear too often. It means filled with, charged with, thick with. And it's also the greenest country I have ever seen. I had the great good fortune to visit Ireland a number of years ago and see the counties where so many of my ancestors came from, Cork, Limerick, and Mayo. So if it's so beautiful, so full of history, why leave? Why did tens of thousands of men, women, and children leave their homeland? In 1695, England passed the Irish penal laws in large part to get rid of a good portion of the native Irish population. The English saw Ireland as both breadbasket and pasture. It's marvelous grazing land for sheep and cattle, but it was cluttered up with a lot of Irish, specifically Irish Catholics. The penal laws were appallingly cruel and brutal. Irish Catholics couldn't vote, couldn't study or practice medicine or law, they couldn't serve as an officer in the military. They couldn't own a horse worth more than five pounds. The practice of the Catholic faith itself was basically illegal. Priests were often imprisoned or banished. Irish music was against the law. In addition, the 1703 Popery Act was a major spur to emigration. Irish landowners were prevented from handing down their land to the oldest son, which preserves the large acreage. Instead, the land had to be divided between all children, including daughters. 
So within about a single generation, the majority of large native Irish land holdings had been fragmented. This meant less power, less ability to make a living. You can't make much of a living on an acre to, uh, to feed your family. And even if you could, English landlords routinely confiscated land from tenant farmers if their crops were successful. And this is a quote from the Acts and Statutes of 1695. It was even illegal to teach the Catholic faith and you were um, uh, possibly upon pain of paying 20 pounds and or prison for three months if you were caught doing so. So very quickly, um, a good portion of native Irish, uh, particularly Irish Catholics, were absolutely impoverished. Starvation was the watchword long before the potato famine in the 1830s and 1840s. Oliver Goldsmith, a well-known Irish poet, wrote an absolutely pathetic poem about how beautiful Ireland was, but all these charms are fled. In addition, the Irish had to contend with some pretty nasty beliefs on the part of the English, as well as from some of the countries to which they were traveling. These are just three of the countless cartoons depicting the Irish as dirty, ignorant, emotional, and foolish. So why would you choose to be an indentured servant? So from the early 1700s on, people were looking for a way out of starvation. Indentured servitude offered one path to hope. Although many people, including Germans, Dutch, French, and others chose indentured servitude, the majority of indentured servants in America were Irish. Very basically, you would sign a contract, an indenture, with either a ship's captain or a broker or agent, and you would agree to serve a fixed amount of time in order to pay back your passage over to the colonies. These contracts were legally binding, and indentured servitude itself was governed by legislation which varied from colony to colony. The pros to indentured servitude are pretty obvious. We've listed them here. Um, the ability to practice your faith, uh, owning land, that was a big motivation. Uh, the opportunity to work in your trade or learn a new set of skills. Hope, hope for a better life, hope for adventure, hope for success, hope just for an even chance at betterment. But of course, uh, indentured servitude uh, had two sides and there were a great deal of dangers. Um, although it was possible to work for a decent master, uh, work hard but successfully for your term and then go live your life, there were many, many pitfalls and dangers as an indentured servant. And I've listed just a few here. Um, you were worked hard and treated poorly. Um, the ship's crossing uh, weakened a lot of you, uh, a lot of indentured servants, and many of them died uh, before their indentures were completed. Um, one of the really sad things was that entire families signed indentures, mother, father, and children. And there was no promise that you were going to serve in the household together or even in the same town. And once your indenture was sold, which it could be from person to person, you might very easily lose track of family members and never find each other again. Uh, another uh, problem, there were specific dangers for female indentured servants. No protection against a master who wanted to take advantage of you. And if you did end up pregnant, your child could be farmed out with another family until he or she was older, and you'd get additional time tacked onto your indenture, months or even years for the work you missed by being pregnant. So why were indentured servants welcomed in the colonies? Starting a new colony was tough work, and not everyone was jumping on board, literally, to sail off to the frontier in America. Indentured servants provided the labor to fell trees, clear land, build houses and forts, plant and harvest and hunt, and make towns and cities. It is very rare to hear the words of actual indentured servants. Um, written accounts are as rare as hen's teeth. I really had to look hard to find some. 
Uh, many indentured servants could not write, and many left that part of their lives behind them when they completed their terms of service. One very rare account was written by a man and a former indentured servant named William Morale, who published his autobiography uh, describing his experiences. He was born in England, traveled to America. He ended up in Burlington County working for Isaac Pearson, a clockmaker and goldsmith. And Morale's writings provide very interesting facts, uh, among much else, um, depending on your circumstances. And as an indentured servant, you actually had some bargaining power with your master. Uh, Morale himself bargained with Pearson to work in a different location, and Pearson accommodated him. Morale also, though, had a really kind of hot and cold relationship uh, with his master, Isaac Pearson. Sometimes he wrote that they got along very well, things went smoothly, and other times they did not. Um, there was real friction there. Uh, we also learned from uh, Mr. Morale about how much it might cost to buy an indentured servant, if you were wondering. His time was purchased by Pearson for 11 pounds. And we'll hear more from Mr. Morale in a little while. Many, many advertisements appeared regularly in newspapers, notifying the public of the arrival of a fresh group of likely servants. This particular ad is typical. Uh, we learn a lot from just this small amount of writing. We learn what ship these men and boys have come across on. We learn that the port of sale was London. Uh, we learned that in this case, as, as well as a number of other cases, the uh, men and, and women and children were kept on board until they, their time was purchased. And that it seems that uh, the two gentlemen mentioned in the ad, Edward Horn and William Rawl, were acting as agents or brokers for this particular group. And we also learned that uh, you could get an indentured servant for cash, flour, or bread. Not bad, a real bargain. Uh, some of the ads are fascinating because they start out by describing the number of people and then just go right into, we also have linen and wine and things like that. And so these people, these human beings are kind of grouped together with other consumer goods. Some ads go into really specific detail. Um, and because, as I mentioned, we have very little in the way of writing first person about indentured servants, the newspapers are, are really um, where we find some, some gold. We really dig and we, we uncover some very interesting things. This particular ad goes into specific detail about the skills and trades of prospective indentured servants. This advertisement is great. Uh, if you were a tradesman or artisan and you're looking for already trained help, this was a great way of getting somebody who could start right in. Um, they were already up to speed. You didn't have to train them. Um, so here we have white smiths. Uh, these were people who worked with the white metals such as tin, blacksmiths, locksmiths, masons, plasterers, butchers, joiners, even a coachman and a manservant. And apparently they also came with references and recommendations. Uh, sometimes depending on how skilled you were, you actually got a shorter um, indenture. So somebody with a, a lot of skill, perhaps the blacksmith or locksmith, you might be able to have only a, a three year uh, indenture instead of maybe a five, seven or even 10 year indenture. And it was much easier to, uh, to get with somebody good if you had skills that were really marketable. Here are three more uh, advertisements um, showing that indentured servants really came from all walks of life. Depending on who bought your time, you could practice your trade, maybe learn some new skills, improve your current skills, and very importantly, make connections and friends. And if you were really lucky and were working for somebody who was relatively compassionate, um, this could be a connection that would serve you well almost for the rest of your life. But we hear from William Morale again, of course, that not all was wonderful. Although each colony did have legislation in place to oversee indentured servitude, many indentured servants were just unaware of their legal rights. 
Uh, if you're an illiterate Irish immigrant coming over in servitude, you have no idea what you can and cannot do. You have no idea what's available to you through the courts. Uh, even when somebody might be bold enough to try to bring a master to court for ill treatment or another issue, uh, Morali details that uh, it's 10 to 1. If he does not get his licks for his pains, as I have experienced upon the like occasion, to my cost. Punishments abounded. Uh, many of the same punishments me meted out to enslaved men and women were meted out to indentured servants. Running away um, repeatedly could get you fitted with an iron collar for your troubles. On the left is a watercolor sketch of a female servant with an iron collar. That weird little scroll was not for decoration, but to make the collar much more noticeable and almost impossible to hide. Runaway advertisements also provide lots of information about everything from clothing an indentured servant owned to physical characteristics, uh, a real hint of the story and drama behind their lives. This particular ad on the right, if you notice on the bottom, uh, mentions that Irish servant John Hanley has an iron collar about his neck. So what were the differences and similarities between indentured servants and slaves? Although there were a number of similarities, there was one single most profound difference. I cannot stress this enough. For an indentured servant, no matter how brutal their experience, there was a light at the end of the tunnel, however dim. For an enslaved man or woman, there was no light. Germaine Logan, who was born in 1813, was a former slave, an educator, um, and assisted over 1,500 runaway slaves during his lifetime, wrote once that no day ever dawns for the slave, nor is it looked for. For the slave, it is all night, all night forever. So that's the one thing that's very important to remember. Um, I know that anybody who has maybe uh, taken a look online about indentured servants, particularly Irish indentured servants, um, there are some people who are writing that the Irish were slaves. They are absolutely not. I am here to tell you that they were indentured servants. Uh, that's not to make light of the very difficult times that they had, but they were in no way, shape, or form slaves, not permanently. So what was a typical indenture like? Uh, this is an indenture from our own collection. Uh, it gives you an idea of what they looked like. The document of an indentured servant was different from that of an apprentice, which is an entirely different topic. Uh, so what do we see here? Uh, this is an indenture for Alexander McDonnell, uh, who was a weaver, and uh, he was apparently illiterate. You see down there at the uh, bottom right of the indenture, a little X or a cross, and then you have on either side Alexander McDonnell, his mark. Uh, so he wrote that X, and then someone else who was filling in the form wrote that it was his signature. We also learn the period of his indenture was five years, which was pretty standard. And on the back is some inscriptions. So we also learned that McDonald came over on the ship George and John from England, arriving in New York in 1728. And after you finished your indenture, you were us usually given the form or some sort of other written document that said that you had discharged your indenture satisfactorily, and then you moved on. Now with all of that, why on earth would you choose to be an indentured servant? And the big carrot on the stick for that was something called freedom dues. Um, this was the real big perk. This was an agreed upon assortment of, I guess you could call it prizes if you wanted to, given to someone upon completion of their term of service. Um, with a lot of other aspects of indentured servitude, freedom dues were described by colony laws. Some colonies were a little hazy on it, but interestingly enough, New Jersey was very clear about what a master legally owed his servant at the end of the time period. So once you finished, you could look forward to two suits of clothing, uh, a felling axe and a garden hoe. 
seven bushels of Indian corn, and anywhere from 25 to 75 acres. Freedom dues were important. As I said, this, this was the carrot at the end of a long stick. They allowed a newly freed servant to start his or her own life, planting their own crops on their own land. It was also meant to guarantee that a newly freed servant wouldn't immediately become a burden on the local community as a pauper. However, not every master honored the agreement. And so here we hear from William O'Reilly again, who tells us that after he completed his time with Isaac Pearson, um, he says it was impossible to e express his satisfaction. Um, apparently though, Pearson's freedom dues were subpar and Morale describes them as indifferent. So we have no idea what that means. Um, but then Morale writes that he set off to find a new way of living. Uh, once you were discharged and you completed your service, you were free, period. Um, you could marry as an indentured servant. You were not allowed to marry unless you had express written permission from your masters. Um, but you could marry, you could live where you wanted, you could practice your trade. Uh, when you had children, your children were born free and were, would continue to be free. The fact that you were indentured servant had no effect on them. Now, what about female indentured servants? There were certainly many of them. Some signed on as indentured servants along with husbands and children, while others signed on as unmarried women looking for the same hope and opportunities that their male counterparts were seeking. Many pitfalls here, as I'm sure we can all imagine. A very rare account by a woman named Elizabeth Ashbridge details her experiences, most unpleasant, when she was an indentured servant. Um, she was a very young girl, not even out of her teens, when she signed on as an indentured servant in England. Um, it's very clear that she really didn't understand what she was doing, but it was she was just desperate to escape uh, a bad situation at home in Ireland. Um, she was born in England and then had moved to Ireland to live with in, um, uh, relatives, and that was not going well, and she just wanted to get out. So she leaped at the first chance, and it happened to be as an indentured servant over to uh, Philadelphia. Um, so in 1732, she arrives in Philadelphia, then immediately goes to New York. Her time was purchased by a brutal and cruel man. She suffered a great deal. However, she was able to save up enough money to buy off the remainder of her time which was an option for some. And then she used her needle, she was a very good seamstress, to support herself as she describes it handsomely. Uh, so this might be how she saved money. Many indentured servants were allowed to work for other local people on a part-time or seasonal basis. And so they could hoard their coins for freedom. Ashbridge also describes, this is very fascinating, I haven't been able to follow up on this yet, but I'm going to see if I can dig up and some more information about this. She describes at one point that on the journey across to the United States, to America, a number of the Irishmen who were going over as indentured servants were planning to kill the crew and sail to America as free men, but the plan failed and nothing came of it. So what was the typical indentured servant in Monmouth County? Um, usually a man, uh, often between 18 and 25, although that did differ greatly. Um, mostly emigrated from Ireland, but you also see a lot of English, um, Holland, Germany. Sometimes that's difficult to tell because in, for example, runaway ads, they're described as Dutch, which could mean from Holland or it could mean Deutsch, German. Um, sometimes, very rarely, Scotland. Uh, they were often already skilled, uh, but there were plenty who came over really just regular general laborers. The indenture here in Monmouth County was usually between three and five years. Um, women quite often served more because they were quote unquote less skilled. Uh, female indentured servants were often not noted by age, um, although sometimes I come across ads where they're described as a very good cook or a good spinner, um, good with children, works well with her needle, things like that. Uh, I can't tell you how many indentured servants there were in Monmouth County, uh, let alone how many Irish indentured servants there were. Uh, more accurate records, interestingly enough, were kept uh, for permanently enslaved men and women and children. 
The temporary nature of indentured servants was one of the main reasons for that. They were technically not property. Their time was, they technically were not. Um, not property in the sense that enslaved persons were considered to be. So they rarely, if ever, show up in estate inventories or other documents. So it's very difficult to trace them. So what could you do when the situation was unbearable? You could run and run, many of them did. Again, here's where newspaper advertisements provide a wealth of information and amazing snippets of stories that we never know the beginning or end of. In May of 1750, for example, uh, Irish servants John Maguire and Catherine Carroll escaped together from Middletown, right here in Monmouth County, uh, passing as man and wife. It might well be that because as indentured servants, they were prohibited from marrying, uh, John and Catherine might have decided not to wait, but to run and take their chances. Um, so I find myself sometimes after reading a lot of these ads, I, I start to, to root for these people. I think to myself, run, run, escape, make a good life. Um, but we'll never know the ends of the stories. Advertisements also give us a glimpse of the faces and bodies of indentured servants. It's very interesting to see what um, the individual who's placing the ad, who is usually the master, um, is, is deciding to put in the article, the, the uh, advertisement. So on the left here from Middletown, Monmouth County, you have a man named William Jones, and Robert Hartshorn is describing him as a man with a sour countenance, with a large scar in the lower part of his face, slow and soft-spoken, much afflicted with a dry cough. That dry cough to me sounds very possible like tuberculosis. Uh, and then on the right, we have another runaway, um, Neil McFall, um, about 45 years of age. That's very old for an indentured servant of a small st middle stature, has a large nose. So again, no idea whether either of these gentlemen made it. Now, I mentioned the Allen House earlier. Uh, tavern keeper Josiah Halstead owned and operated the tavern at the Allen House from 1754 to 1770 when he was thrown into debtor's prison. His story is great. Uh, that's another story for another time. Um, that's one that I want to tell you because it's fabulous. Halstead had not one, but at least two indentured servants make a break for it. Um, I always kind of wonder what that implies about Josiah Halstead himself. If he has more than one person trying to run away, what does that say about him as a master? I have no idea. First in 1756, uh, his German uh, servant, Johann Jeremiah Maya, escaped with, as uh, Halstead described it, plenty of cash. So we don't know where he got that. Perhaps he stole it out of the, uh, the till of the tavern. And there on the left is a detail of a pencil drawing that we have in the collection. That's the earliest known depiction of the Allen House right there on the left. And for those of you who are familiar with the Allen House, you'll recognize it right away. A second indentured servant scooted uh, in 1763. This young man, uh, Edward May, uh, not only ran, but he took one of Halstead's horses. And so we learn here that uh, Edward had some really swift skills as a bricklayer, uh, that he was illiterate, that he was as tall as I am, 5'4", and that he had smallpox at some point. That's another thing that you see over and over and over again in the runaway ads, how many people had had smallpox. And that was noted just as a matter of course, a little bit pocked, um, a little, had a, some markings of the smallpox on his face. So you see that over and over again. And again, it's an interesting indication about 18th century health. And as I've noted, um, we have a lot more information about male indentured servants as opposed to female. Uh, it's very unusual to come across a runaway ad for a single one woman running. Uh, but here we have one from Middletown again in Monmouth County, a woman named Martha Barnes, 36. Again, a little on the old side for indentured servants. Uh, this hints at the pathos of the lives of these women. Um, you can see here that the, uh, the ad notes um, 
light hair and blue eyes with one tooth out before, probably meant one of the incisors right there, and great ringworms on her breast and arms. Uh, ringworm is a highly contagious fungal infection. It's called ringworm because of how it looks. There's no worms actually involved, but it's very unpleasant, uh, very itchy with a red or silvery rash. And it's transmitted from skin to skin contact. Um, so it's possible that Martha was uh, living in uh, circumstances that made this transmission uh, very possible. So again, I have no idea what happened to Martha, whether she got where she wanted to go or what happened to her afterwards. So some of these ads really hint at, at some of the questions that I certainly have. Um, for example, what was the relationship between an indentured servant and an enslaved servant within uh, a single household or neighboring households? Uh, because there were any number of households that relied on both enslaved labor and the labor of indentured servants, relatively temporary labor. This particular ad, uh, 1750 in May, hints at a very great deal. A servant named William McKay, a small short fellow, escaped with an African-American man named Toby. And this isn't something, if you think about it, this isn't something you do on the spur of the moment. There's a level of trust involved here, communication, at least temporarily. Why go together? So in thinking about it, um, you can call it a theory or you can call it a guess of mine, whichever you like. It could be for protection. One man alone uh, might be suspicious, but if William and Toby kept their heads and played it out well, they could pose as master and servant and provide each other with a cover story until they got where they were going. That's very possible. Again, we have no idea what happened to James, uh, to uh, William or Toby. And it was not unusual for male and female indentured servants to run. Uh, here's William um, Davis and Mary Kelly, fellow Irish people. They worked in two separate households, but clearly knew each other and very possibly even loved each other. And so they planned their escape and went. If I had to pick one advertisement that boiled down all of indentured servitude into its saddest and most heartbreaking, it would be this one. It's not Monmouth County, it's not even New Jersey, it's Virginia. But the just the sorrow in this, I, I had to include it. Whole families signed on as indentured servants. Uh, there was no guarantee that you'd get placed in one household. In fact, chances were most likely that you'd all be farmed out to different households, including your children, no matter how young they were. And if you or were or your family members were sold a couple of times, as I had mentioned, there's no real way to keep track of where everyone was. So here you have 11 year old James Gregg, uh, red hair, freckled. You can just picture him in your mind. His mother stole him, was stolen by his mother. Perhaps she felt the need to rescue him. We don't know what situation James was in that his mother felt she had to rescue him. Uh, his mother and father aren't named, uh, so we don't know what on earth is behind this story. How could you steal your own son? How could you as a human being describe a mother stealing her own son? Um, take a look at the date that Mrs. Gregg did this March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. And what did the general public think about indentured servitude, particularly the issue regarding runaways? We thank Benjamin Franklin for publishing this particular editorial in his Pennsylvania Gazette, which is where a good portion of my information came from. During the 18th century, New Jersey, particularly Monmouth County, did not have a major newspaper. So a lot of times we have to turn either to the New York City newspapers or to the Philadelphia newspapers of this time period to glean information. And it's amazing how much you can really shake loose uh, dealing with Monmouth County just by reading the paper. Uh, so Benjamin Franklin published this editorial uh, and it noted that runaways were a real bother, that they were wronging their masters by running away, causing large expense and great trouble. Um, of course, I haven't yet come across any editorials uh, talking about the conditions of indentured servants or the need for improvement. 
So once your indenture time was finished, what then? If you were lucky enough to have a relatively decent master, you got your freedom dues, he or she wished you good fortune, um, you might even get some help getting established uh, or help in other ways. But for many Irish indentured, in fact, for indentured of all nationalities, the end of indenture meant the beginning of uncertainty and often heartbreak. These three advertisements were all looking for lost family members. At the top, Catherine Dardis was looking for Michael Dardis, a husband, possibly a brother, who had set out from Dublin as an indentured servant. Uh, next, we have Melchior Fisher, who wanted to find his daughter, Maria, uh, who had signed a seven-year indenture with one John Smith. And at the bottom, Johannes Weiss was another father looking for a long-lost daughter. The ads, of course, only give one part of the story. We'll never know how everything ended. That's the mystery and attraction of history. Uh, indentured servitude continued to be a relatively reliable source of labor for the colonies, for New Jersey. Uh, during the American Revolution, it fell off almost entirely because it was very difficult to bring ships across during the conflict. Um, after the war, the American Revolution ended, it picked up again for a while. Uh, but the type of indentured servitude that the Irish experienced mostly in the 18th and early 19th century really fell off by 1840, 1850. And by that time, you virtually see nothing um, about indentured servitude anymore in Monmouth County. Now, for those of you who thought this was interesting and would like to learn more, because um, I've only touched very briefly uh, at Irish on Irish indentured servitude. There's so much out there. Um, I strongly encourage everyone to watch Carol Jarbo's presentation of Maggie Delaney, a first person character she developed over many years. It's free on YouTube, courtesy of James Townsend and Sons. And those reenactors among you will recognize the name. They provide reenactment equipment. Uh, in the United States. They have amazing videos on colonial cooking and so on, but this one is amazing. I've seen it five times. I was watching it earlier this afternoon and had to drag myself away yet again because it is, Carol's presentation is so stark and it's just such an authentic voice. It'll have you weeping. So if you're gonna watch it, have some tissues nearby, you're gonna need them. Um, I've also listed three books uh, that were invaluable to my research. Don't be put off by the title of Allison Smith's book, Colonists in Bondage. Uh, it's not a steamy s and dark romance, uh, but a very matter of fact, statistics heavy book on indentured servitude. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your attention for this presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned a little bit and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And as always, a huge thank you to Dana. Um, and I know this presentation will be available on our website if you'd like to hear it again or want to recommend it to anyone else. And so from my Irish Garrity, Mimno, Leach, and Fitzgerald ancestors, I wish you all a happy St. Patrick's Day. That was awesome. I'm good. <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. Hold on one second. I'm just going to switch over here. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, so before we get to the Q&A, which I already have a question, so I'm excited. Let's see if we can switch. Okay, I uh, just want to tell everybody about um, our next lecture, April 21st, with Glenn Cashin. Glenn is uh, a baseball historian. He's going to bring us the history of this great American pastime through the lens of one small town. And if you can't guess what town that is, it's Freehold. Well, there it is in the title, History of Freehold <laughs> Baseball. Um, the early days of the sport, he's going to talk about a 1934 all-star tr all trip to Japan, the inception of the colored teams, and brushes with the babe will be discussed. So you'll learn about the hopes, opportunities, and thrilling victories of the talented men of Freehold Baseball. Okay, so we're going to get to the Q&A. Um, let's see, can you see your Q&A chat, Bernadette? Your, uh... um, I see the screen that says Q&A. Should Do I click on the, chat? the chat button? No, okay, that's okay. I'll read it. It's fine. Oh, there we go. Okay. Can you see it? I'm going to start with me because I can. Go ahead. 
Okay, I noticed in one of your ads that um, it was talking about the indentured servant and the, the runaway slave, Toby, right? And it said that if um, the indentured servant was returned, the, the uh, person who caught him would get three pounds. And if Toby was returned, the person would get 40 shillings. So it looks like an indentured servant is you know, worth more um, than an enslaved person. I'm just wondering why you would opt to have an indentured servant, which was more expensive and you'd have them for less time than, you know, than a slave. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Some people actually, it was, it was basically economics. Um, some people might need uh, help for a short period of time. Um, other times people could not actually afford to, to purchase a slave. Um, however, uh, you might be able to come up with anywhere from three to 11 to 15 pounds to buy somebody's time for anywhere from three to seven years. And then you would be able to really pick and choose um, maybe somebody who was trained in your line of work. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the uh, rewards really seem to vary a lot. Um, some, some indentured servants who ran, uh, there was a big reward, five pounds, six pounds sometimes for them. Other times, uh, the standard was about 40 shillings reward. Sometimes you're only, out, I've seen ads that were only offering 20 shillings. So you get the feeling that these people would like them back, but they're, they're not going to put out too much reward to get them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Kathy's asking what the background is of the drawing that accompanied the Seeking Loved Ones slide. Oh, um, I got that off the internet. Um, I think it's a um, uh, late 18th century watercolor. Uh, I actually think it's European. I think it's um, from the Netherlands, but I can get specific information for you if you'd like it. Okay. Mary Hussey is asking, um, are most of the documents from the collections of MCHA? And if so, what collections? Not most of them, but just a few, right? Uh, the only indenture is the one for Alexander McDonald, and that one's in our collection. All the others, uh, the newspapers, were all from newspapers.com. Okay. And then we so have that, those are my video games. I have newspapers.com and Ancestry. And so when other people are playing, you know, like Candy Crush or whatever, I'm on Ancestry and newspapers researching people who've been dead for 200 years. I know. It's so addicting. Um, it we, really have a bunch is. Of, we have a lot of indentured apprentices, right? Or apprentice yeah, indentures. It, in, apprenticeship was, was different than indentured servitude. Uh, there was a whole different set of laws and um, uh, expectations. Um, basically for an apprentice, um, quite usually it was a, a young man, um, your son, anywhere from, I've seen apprentices as early as eight years old, but usually it was around 10 to 12. You would put them with a particular person, um, whatever trade you might want, uh, silversmith, for example. And the expectation was is that your son was going to grow up in this household. He was going to be housed, fed, clothed, and taught the trade. And then he would reach journeyman status, and then he was going to become um, a full silversmith, for example, um, and quite often would be presented with a set of tools. Um, and a lot of times you see that apprentices were really kept within the household. A lot of apprentices ended up marrying the boss's daughters, um, things of that nature. Um, but again, you know, it was, it was really quite different. Okay. And we have somebody watching from Dublin. That's pretty oh, cool. Oh, fabulous. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Tom McCormick. Very cool. I'm glad you, you tuned in. Um, Welcome. So somebody, Anne Van Heys is asking if an indentured servant passed away before fulfilling their time, was their remaining time added to that of family members? No, uh, no, it was not. Um, it, you were tough out of luck mm -hmm. if your indentured servant died early. Oh, well. Um, interestingly enough, I'm, I have the great privilege of being on the, um, the board of the Old Yellow Meeting House in Western uh, Freehold, and uh, part of the burial ground is actually an unmarked um, mass grave for enslaved and for indentured servants. Uh, very often, if you died as an indentured servant, you were, you were buried in a pauper's grave or a mass grave. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Michael is asking, hmm, hold on. If you could explain the financial transactions involved for a given oh, sure. indentured um, it, um, it varied. Um, 
you could quite often uh, a ship's captain uh, or agents or they were acting sort of as brokers would go to a major seaport perhaps you know in either England or Ireland or wherever you're going to be and you would advertise um, you would post notices um, word of mouth and people would come up to you and you would barter with them um, for their time you would pay their passage and they would sign an indenture it was a legally binding document and once you came over to the United to America um, your indenture was then sold. Uh, if you were the ship's captain or the agents, you would then advertise as we've seen in the newspapers. And then if you were interested in getting somebody to help you in your tinsmith shop or wherever your barrel making shop, if you were a cooper, you would go to the ship or the wharf or the dock, wherever these people were being held. Uh, you would speak with them. There would be sort of like a bizarre sort of interview process. You would pick one out and then the legally binding document would be signed by both parties and you would pay your money either to the ship's captain or the broker, whoever who advanced the, uh, the ticket price uh, of the passage over and off you would go with your new indentured servant. Okay, um, we have somebody asking if the, the freed indentured servant would then become um, able to vote, just become a US citizen. Um, once you were a freed indentured servant, you were bound by the same laws as everybody else. So if you were a landowner, depend, and a lot of it depended on what colony you were living in, um, but you, you had all the rights and privileges of, of any citizen, and many indentured servants became citizens, naturalized citizens of America, um, lived here all their lives. William uh, Maroney, interestingly enough, uh, did not have good experiences here in America and eventually returned to England. Okay. And when did this practice end? Um, in, generally, it ended before the Civil War, um, but every so often, sort of the, the same type of transaction where a person's passage would be paid and then they would have to work off that passage money um, continued into the early 20th century, but certainly by no means to the extent that it was practiced in the very late uh, 17th and early 19th, uh, 18th century. Okay, I think that's, I think that's it for questions. Um, and I noticed all the reasons listed that the Irish, you know, came here and chose to do this for the same reasons that the pilgrims did, right? Yeah, Basically. it was, I mean, it, the fact that Irish, Irish music was, was illegal. You could not play it or listen to it um, because of the 1695 uh, penal laws. I mean, that's just astonishing to me. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. We had uh, 218 people tonight. So, awesome. Thank you very awesome. much, everybody. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Bernadette. All right. And I hope to see everybody on April 21st for um, Glenn's lecture. And have a good night. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.